Thank you. So for those of you who were here yesterday, um, you'll recall that I told you primarily about what the cell types in the, in the hippocampus, um, in the greater hippocampal formation did, and um, use that to support some of the ideas about how the hippocampal operates in, uh, as a spatial memory system and as a spatial navigation system. What I left out of the story is one of the major aspects of hippocampal physiology, which is the role that's played by uh, the LFP theta oscillations in the hippocampus. And um, that's the primary uh, goal of my talk today, is to sort of try to see if we can integrate that into the overall story and um, to see what that, um, uh, those oscillations do for hippocampal physiology. And the short story, the bottom line, is that um, they provide a, a timing signal against which the firing timing of the firing uh, of the spikes is measured. And that operates to provide a temporal code. And I guess that's one of the best examples of the way in which the nervous system can use the timing of spikes um, to, to provide information about uh, things in the outside world. Um, there are other examples, but this is still, I think, one of the most um, uh, robust and resilient examples. So um, yesterday I told you that we did a lot of the work in the hippocampus. Here are our electrodes in the CA1 field. And um, much of the work that's done in this area is uh, done in, in, in uh, two-dimensional environments, um, or as Kate will have told you uh, now, uh, in three-dimensional environments, um, in which animals run around in these, in these boxes. But a lot of the work um, that I'm going to talk, tell you about is done on a one-dimensional environment, a linear track. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll describe this a little bit more in detail. But essentially, it just gets the animal to run back and forth between two, uh, two walls which have food on it uh, so that it can be rewarded. And what this does is um, it's not a completely neutral or, or, uh, 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 version of, of this because it does change some of the aspects of the place cell physiology. Um, but it gives you a, the opportunity to get lots and lots of data. And for a lot of this uh, work, we need, we need lots of data. Um, and you can find play cells on the linear track. Uh, I should point out that they're different in general. Play cells in, in two-dimensional environments, shown here, are actually um, uh, direction-free. They're independent of the direction that the animal is heading, so that it makes little difference if the animal is moving north or south or east or west through the field. Whereas on a linear track, they tend to be directional. And I don't know, maybe Mayak has an <laughs> explanation for this, but we really don't understand why that is the case. And it, it's an important observation, and there are some situations in which that's not true. You sometimes find cells which fire in both directions, but by and large, the cells fire in only one direction uh, on the linear track. And as I say, I'm going to spend most of my time trying to integrate this LFP signal, the, um, the 8 to 10 hertz oscillatory uh, signal that's a very, very prominent part and a very large signal uh, in, in hippocampus and in, 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 in hippocampal formation in general. OK, so you know, remember I told you that there are different cell types. There are play cells, uh, grid cells, um, head direction cells, and, and these boundary vector cells, which we think provide the information which the animal uh, extracts from, brain extracts from the environment uh, that can be used to, to uh, create uh, play cells and also to tell the animal where it is. As I say, for a long time, in fact, well before we or anybody else had, had started working on the hippocampus, it was known that one of the prominent signals in hippocampal uh, physiology was this uh, theta LFP theta activity. Um, and it was discovered in about mid-1930s. For a long time, it was thought to be an artifact. Brains don't oscillate. Um, and so it was, it was uh, really quite a, a long time before it was accepted that this was a, a, a true physiological signal. And some of the best work um, about the, the behavioral correlate of this signal was done by Case Van, Van der Wolf, um, who was a, a Canadian working in um, uh, Western Ontario. Um, and he did it in the rat. Uh, up until this point, there was, it was really quite difficult for people to come to any agreement about the, the, the behavioral correlates of, of, of this uh, oscillatory activity. So you can see it here. 
here's, here's an animal running around, and you can see this very nice sinusoidal, as I say in the right, about uh, 7 to 10 hertz oscillation. Uh, looking for all intents, and sometimes it looks like a sawtooth, but quite often it actually looks like a sinusoid. Well, what Kate, Case did was spent interminable hours, uh, these are the days before any uh, automatic uh, recording techniques, looking at the animal and watching uh, a polygraph trace of, 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 this, uh, of this potential and trying to see if he could make some sense of what the relationship between the behavior and the potential was. And what he noticed was, first of all, that they really are three states, but we now think of them mostly as two states of the hippocampal, uh, gross hippocampal physiology. There's the theta activity here, and then there's um, this less synchronized um, potential uh, with a broader spectrum and, 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 and clearly less rhythmic and, and less organized potential, which he called LIA, um, and I, I guess we still call it that large irregular amplitude activity. And sometimes during this you see these sharp waves here shown like this, and they're all, the whole physiology um, which, which is related to that, and um, a lot of the replay and preplay phenomenon which you'll hear uh, later on in, in, in this, um, in this uh, meeting um, is, 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 is related to that, to those, to those oscillations, to those potentials. I won't say anything more about them. Um, but I want to concentrate on this, this theta activity here. Because what you can see is that if you just look at all of the, the various uh, behaviors that are shown here from sitting still uh, and making small movements, uh, and I, I don't think he has it here, but things like eating or drinking or um, more um, uh, ingestive types of, of, of behaviors, that's when you get this, this um, non-theta, if, if, if I can call it that, LIA behavior. Whereas whenever the animal starts to move relative to the environment, and Van Wolf called them voluntary movements, but I think this, the simplest uh, description is whenever he's doing anything which moves his location relative to the environment, translational um, or rotational behavior, then you begin to get this, this theta activity. So if he's swimming, it doesn't really make any difference what the behavior, the, the, how the, the behavior actually manifests itself in, 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 in muscle activity. As long as it's moving around. So if, if, he's, if he's squirming while you're picking him up or you're placing him in a water and he swims around, if he jumps um, out of a box, then um, the, you get it doing either a, a small jump or a large jump. And um, in fact, there's a relationship between the frequency of the, and the amplitude of the theta uh, and the height of the jump. Uh, and that was one of the first observations that there was some relationship between some aspects of this wave and some a aspects of movement. It wasn't just a correlation, gross correlation. There is a, 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 a relationship. And in fact, it turns out, and I won't say much about this, um, that the frequency tends to be um, a, a function of, of, of speed of movement. Okay, well, you can do this a little bit more systematically. You can put an animal on a, in a, uh, on a linear track and, and just look at uh, some aspect of movement, such as the speed of running uh, down the track. Um, and you can see that when he's sitting at one end and eating, you get this uh, irregular large LIA potential. As he starts to run, you get this beautiful sinusoid. And then when he stops to eat at the other end, sometimes you get a little bit of carryover, uh, but then it begins to break up. Okay, for a long time, um, people like Yuri views up. Sorry? Filtering you have to do to get this. Filtering. Yeah. This, is, this is in the raw trace, right? You, could, you can see it in the raw trace. This is a big, big, this is a big signal. Uh, does it say? Uh, no, it doesn't say. So this, this would easily be uh, several hundred millivolts to a half a, uh, half a millivolt. So it's several hundred microvolts to a half a millivolt. So yeah, you can see it. If, if it were completely unfiltered trace, you would see spikes uh, riding on that, but you could still see this hospital. It's, it's a big, big thing. It's probably the biggest LFP potential in, in, in the rat brain. Uh, by, 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 you know, probably the biggest, yeah. Um, the only thing comparable is the, is the thalamocortical oscillations that you get when the animal is sitting quietly. Um, uh, so the filtering, to answer your question directly, is the filters are set usually at from about something like zero, zero of half a hertz. Uh, uh, to, to um, 20 or 30 hertz. So it's way outside the Nyquist criteria. We don't, we don't worry too much about that. Um, it, could be, it could be higher. You can go up to 50. It doesn't make much difference. There are other things in there 
you want to keep below you, you want to keep below your noise, uh, um, and you want to get rid of the gamma. <laughs> so I won't say anything about the gamma, <laughs> but uh, I don't think anybody's going to say anything about gamma. So there's another potential which, in fact, is nested in with the theta, and and is phase related to it, uh, and which is very popular in the neocortex and in the olfactory system, which is gamma. And we're still struggling. We're still struggling in the hippocampus to you know exactly what the what the correlation is. So we showed the gamma actually change with running speed. We wrote a couple of papers on that. Yeah, yeah. So that happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, but the question is, is it just because it's actually related to the, so does the theta. So if, it, if they're related to each other. No, this is the amplitude actually. And the phase. See the phase of gamma processes, which I don't want to jump the gun. Okay. Okay. So you're going to talk about no, I'm not. I'm going to talk about phrase procession, but I'm not going to talk about gamma. So. Okay. Um, okay. So, for for many years, people like Yuri Bazaki, who's spent a large part of his life uh, looking at um, uh, doing source sync pot uh, uh, potentials and uh, doing uh, all kinds of uh, mapping of the theta in the hippocampus and elsewhere, have always said to me, "Okay, okay, what do you think the relationship is between theta?" And, and, the, um, and any of the spatial activity that you're, you keep going on and on. And I guess I, for a long time, believed um, that the relationship was um, something like phase locking. And that was based partly on uh, what one sees if one looks at the <coughs> interneurons, or what are called the theta cells, um, and looks at just the firing rate relative to the, uh, to the ongoing LFP. If you do that for a lot of them, it's not true for all of them, but for a lot of them what you see is that um, when, when the animal sits quietly, like the, you'd expect from the, the LFP, the theta cells are just showing this random firing, again with a, uh, spikes firing and bursts every once in a while. But then when the animal starts to run, the activity increases in, in, in rate and it also um, uh, begins to show this very nice bursting activity, uh, and the bursting, which, which you can see, I won't, I won't show any plots of this, but um, what you can see here is that the bursting actually shows a very nice phase relationship to the ongoing uh, theta activity. I should say that um, there are all, so the whole zoo of, of interneurons in the hippocampus. I think the latest uh, count uh, from people like Freund and, and uh, Buzaki and Samaji is that there were something like 27 different subtypes of interneurons, which you could classify in terms of their, their projections, in terms of their, uh, their transmitters, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, the, the, but as, and most of them show this kind of uh, relationship. Yeah? These are single cell recordings? Or yeah, this is just single, th these are, this is just one single, in fact, this is the first cell I ever recorded from the hippocampus. We uh, fetch clamp? Uh, no, it's just one extracellular recording. We, you, yeah, we can't say for absolutely sure that it's just one cell, but as far as we can tell using the techniques we have available to us, which are extracellular tetrodes, uh, this was done with a single sharp electrode, but with uh, tetrodes, we, we, we're more or less convinced that this is just a single cell. The amplitude is consistent and, and so on and so forth. But you're right. I mean, if you're, if you're querying how confident you can be that using extracellular recording, looking at the potentials that are outside the cell, you can be sure that you're, those potentials are coming from only one cell. There, there's always a, a slight, uh, we, we sweep that out of the carpet. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, and work done around the same time, this is really quite old work in, 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 in the New York lab by Steve Fox, um, in which they looked at the relationship between not just the theta cells, but also the, uh, the place cells and the, uh, and the LFP, suggested that that was, in fact, right, that there was a phase-locked relationship. And they, um, uh, but they did the work on a, on, a, on a running track, on a running wheel, so the animals were placed on running wheels, and they, they looked at the cells which were only firing intermittently, as you'd expect. If you, if you take a place cell and you stick the animal uh, onto a, a running wheel and let it run in place, and it's very unlikely that it's, the animal is uh, uh, in, in, the, in the, uh, the field of that place cell, so you're not going to get the, 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 the dense firing that you see when the animal runs through the field. So after many um, years of thinking about it, and also having noticed that, in fact, under certain circumstances, there wasn't a fixed phase. It looked to me like uh, up until around 
1990, um, that the phase was random. And whenever Buzaki would ask me that question, I would say to him, nah, it just looks random to me. I don't know. I don't know what this beta stuff is, but because it just doesn't look like there's any relationship. I decided to go back and look at it. Um, so wait, for 23 years you thought it was random? <laughs> you decided to look at it? I don't get it. Actually, so it, uh, I, I thought it was random from 1970 to 19, yeah, 23 years. You're pretty, you're very quick with this math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really, really formidable. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, actually, so there's a little bit of story there. I had actually, um, I wasted a lot of my career, <laughs> two or three years I wasted my career working on rabbits. <laughs> and there, the, the, L, the LFPs are about twice large. They're easily a millivolt. And every once in a while, I would just look. Well, this is before computers, you know. And I would just look at the screen and see if I could see any phase relationship between the firing of the play cell. And, and it just looked random. Uh, you could fire any, you could see any phase you wanted. Um, so I decided I'd better go back and look at it. Um, and of course, one of the things you should realize is, um, although I presented lots of figures of nice Gaussian place fields in, in two dimensionals, um, that's a bit of a con, and it's a bit of a, 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 an artifact of averaging. Because if you look at what happens if an animal just runs through the place field on a single trial, then what you see is that the cell doesn't go brrrr. It doesn't have that kind of fire. What it does is it goes It fires with uh, this bursting activity. Um, so here's a, an example. Here's an animal running on a linear track. Here's the, 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 the speed profile. Here's the oscilla oscillations. And you can see here f one, um, two, three, four, five play cells. And then there's one of these theta cells. And the theta cell fires along the whole of the, the track, whereas each of these play cells, as, as, as you'd expect, fires only over a restricted portion. But you can see each one of them is going brub, 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 brub. And in fact, you can already see that the firing rate tends to be low at the ends of the field and then ramp up to, to a, a peak in the middle. OK, so I thought, OK, I'm going to sit here. I had a very nice data set, and I just sat there and looked uh, day after day at the runs through, uh, through, through across uh, through a field. I had about two or three days worth of data. And in the beginning, it made no sense at all. But eventually, it began to dawn on me that um, if you looked at a run on, 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 on a, a linear track like this, um, or a, a, actually it was a, most of the data came from <coughs> plus mazes, but this is a better example. Um, and you looked at the relationship between the uh, firing of, of, of a cell and this LFP, well, you saw that the phase was, in fact, not constant. It was changing, but it was changing in a very systematic way. And you can almost see it right in a, a single run. This is a bit of a cheat. It's hard to see it in single runs. I have to make some excuse for why it took me three days to see this. Um, quite often, you can't see it on single runs because some of the spikes drop out. Um, but if you have a, a good run in which the cell fires on each of the uh, oscillations, then what you can see, as shown here, where we've marked the, uh, the zero crossing, positive to negative zero crossing of the associated theta. And this is recorded from the same electrode with different filtering. So you break the signal into a low pass and, and high pass filters. What you can see by the, if you look at the relationship between the firing of the cell and these ticks, is that when the animal first get, come, comes into the field, the ticks line up. But then progressively, the, 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 the spikes move forward on, on the wave. They change their phase. Uh, and when the animal is halfway through the field, the, the spike occurs about halfway uh, along the wave. And it goes through a whole, um, in, in general, 360-degree oscillation on a really, really good drive. Usually it goes through less. Yeah? Most physicists would get a little bit nervous that you were assigning a phase to a fairly random signal. Uh, Wh sorry, which is the random signal? This one? Yeah. Uh, uh, it yeah, really you, has, has it's, it's totally did, arbitrary. Did you try to fit a sign through that? It yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah. Okay, so this is, I'm just giving you a little bit of history here. This is an observation. <laughs> Of course, then we come in, all, all the, the mathemat math mathematicians come in and they say, oh, let's fit a sine wave to this. And, 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 and in fact, all of the phase uh, relationships are done on the fitted uh, relationship with the fitted wave. But you use here zero crossing. So you have, a, you have the mean line, and that's your zero? For yeah. The, and, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 you find the zero crossings in, in the obvious way. Um, OK? 
So if you now say, OK, and here's another example, uh, what does all this mean? Well, let's then just plot um, the, um, the phase relationship uh, to this wave, um, shown here, um, against various variables. And obviously, the most the first thing we're going to look at is some spatial variable, like the, the actual distance through the field, or the distance along the track, or whatever you want. And what you can see here for this, uh, for this cell, which is actually quite a nice one, is that there's a very good, really quite linear. I'm never quite sure that it's linear, but it's, it's linear to the first approximation. Uh, and the correlation is about 0.71. Across a large number of cells across the population, it's usually about 0.55, which in biology is pretty, pretty good. And what this means, and the reason for this, is shown on this right-hand side here, is that um, the, the cell is essentially oscillating, and it's oscillating at a higher frequency than the, 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 the population uh, LFP. Um, and you can show that fairly easily by looking at the autocorrelation of the cell here and comparing it with the periods uh, of, the, of, the, of the LFPs taken at the same time from the same electrode. And you can see they're different. And the cell is, 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 has a, a slightly um, higher um, frequency than the, than the period itself. OK, so that's, that's the simple explanation for what's going on, is that there are two oscillators, and, and they're uh, out of phase. But it turns out that, for example, the cell f always uh, tends to start, start firing at the same point in the LFP. So they're not just running uh, independently of each other. They're related to each other. Um, and and, uh, and there, there's some relationship between the two oscillators. It's so not as though they're totally um, um, independent of each other. The, the, the two oscillators, one is the actual play cells, and the other one is the is this, glo this, glo this, this wave, which we don't know what it is, uh, but we think it's probably representing some sort of gross oscill oscillatory uh, activity across the whole population, probably. Um, membrane potential oscillations, firing of cells, all sorts of things. But they must all be synchronized in some way, or at least be related to each other, because they do sum to this, this exercise. I'm just trying potential. to distinguish. Is when you say that the oscillator is slightly ahead, is that distinct from the statement that phase depends on position? Because as the particle it's the moves, same thing. It's, it's the, the same, same thing, right? Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. the same. Well, it, 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 it can be the same thing if, if the phase takes into account things like speed. Yeah, uh, if it it's, moves, uh, then it it's uh, it, 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 exactly what 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 Ketchum was saying. It, it it has to it there has to be that fixed relationship. It, it has to take the speed. What happens if the rat stops in the middle of a play field and then keeps going? It's a bugger. <laughs> 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 Another failed experiment. <coughs> good sure question. So it's a good question. I mean, I've tried actually, and to get the animals to do that, to stop Don't dead, they occasionally stop and it's not enough data, right? So you need. So I tried training very hard, training animals to sort of stop turning a tone on and get them to stop and then st stay still. What they do is they stop and they stop mooching around, thinking, "All right, when are you going to let me go again?" and all that sort of stuff. And but that's just fine. Then, when you, but because you want to plot versus the position, so they keep so they mess around and keep going. I'll around. tell you what I think happens, but I'm, don't quote me. <laughs> I think you get a a, a temple slow temple um, reset of the. Uh, the system, but I'm not sure. And then, it, and then it, 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 you, you get a the, the phase precession then actually accelerates through the rest of the field. But without good data, <laughs> uh, but it's a good experiment and it's one that should be done because it, it speaks to the whole question of whether it's internal dynamics or, or whether it's it's imposed from the outside. And I'll, I'll just say a little bit about that. Yeah. Mind. You have stronger correlation with position than time, right yeah. there. Yeah. So and this is. So exactly then, of course, you time. you know you really have to uh, uh, to talk a little bit about what else. You know, we, if you just look at position, um, then that's what you're going to see. Okay. But if you look um, at other things like time, and you can pick the time uh, to start, um, or um, or the firing rate, and this is, of course is, is this is controversial because. Um, and I think Mayak is one of the people who believes this, is that there's a, a, a better correlation or a good correlation with firing rate um, than, than, than we found. But under certain circumstances, we're pretty sure that, the, that we can uncouple the, fire, the instantaneous firing rate from the, um, from the, the, the phase shift. Um, and, and these are the, the population data. 
So this is controversial. Um, I, I think we'll stand by our, our statement that the, the correlation is best with position um, and, uh, and, and less good with uh, firing rate. There can't be a complete uncoupling between firing rate, the cell has to fire and, and, and so on and so on, if it fires too much. So there has to be some relationship, but it's a very, very loose tenuous one. Is this all measured with linear correlation? Because it seems yep. like a lot of these are sort of... Yeah, yeah. Common. So this is all, yeah, this is all linear correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it won't, if you want to come back and, and, and look at something else, quadratics or something else like that, then uh, it might, something might come there. But, but yeah, so there is, you, you might want to fit this with something um, other than this, or some people think that this might be two curves, one uh, which shows a very nice precession here, and then uh, something going, uh, going awry at the, at the end there. So there's still, still a lot of, things. yeah. Sorry to bring you back, but the LFP signal, which, which you said uh, you believe the frequency changes with speed. Yeah. Is that a linear relationship itself? Uh, I haven't included cl included that in, but yeah, it's pretty it's pretty pretty linear. Yeah, it's very linear. Yeah. And, it and that and that and, and, and that's an important. It's got to be some. It doesn't have to be perfectly linear, but it's got to be some um, some function of, of uh, speed. Yeah. Sorry. Several groups, us as well as McNaughton group, has shown that precession is quite nonlinear. Yeah. It goes straight, and then at the end, there is very little. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's something funny going on linear. here. Yeah, but you can still show that there's sure. a very good, this is, this is still a very good linear fit. So, you know, unless you've got some idea of why it's nonlinear, what's happening here. Um, well, we have a paper 10 years ago <laughs> that you don't like. <laughs> Mike, Mike and I don't agree on this. <laughs> this is the red rag to the bull here. <laughs> okay, well, thinking about this, it seemed that there were and Mayak will give you another, another version of, of how you can do this. Um, but one possible way in which you can reduce this phenomenon is to think that um, there are several oscillators, as, as uh, Ketchin said, with different frequencies. Um, and one instantiation of this, but it's not the only way of doing it, is that the, the, um, the two oscillators actually are impinging on the same cell. Was uh, it ruled out that. by Remy's neuron paper? Uh, I don't. Well, the, the the fact that it's you mean that it's a single oscillator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean that that because because that you that the, the space constant is such that yeah. you you would begin to get synchronization. There's not two oscillators. Um, no, it just rules out that this is a standard that you can use a standard model of the neuron and then apply it to it. You could you could use all sorts of rather more sophisticated uh, things, which fit with, with with for example uh, filters in one direction, not the other. Right. So have I, have anybody ever done this with the no. neuron model? No. So right now, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not wedded to this. It's just an easy way of explaining it. Um, so, um, I, so I guess what, what um, I guess the simplest question is whether you can have two independent oscillators in one cell without, uh, given, given the, the biophysics of the cell, without them uh, phase locking into each other. And I guess the question is also how long um, that process takes place. We're talking about a very short, we're talking about a couple of cycles of the oscillator. Um, and the question is how long it would be before they would begin to sync. Um, but I'm not wedded to the standard model of the neuron. And this might actually be. Um, so what, what this is suggesting then is that if you had two oscillators, um, and let's assume for the time being that they're not uh, in the same cell, um, with different frequencies, and you added them together, what you would get would be this, um, this interference pattern, where the, uh, the overall envelope of the in interference pattern um, is uh, given by the difference between the two waves, and the, uh, the internal um, uh, oscillations are given by the, the average of the two oscillations. <laughs> and that would, if that were the case, that would explain quite a bit about the, of, of the phenomenon that we actually see on the linear track. Um, it would explain, uh, for example, it would explain the phase precession effect if you assume that one of the oscillators was, uh, was um, uh, actually represented by that extracellular uh, LFP theta, say this one, um, and that the, uh, the second oscillator was uh, uh, impinging on the cell or part of the, the cell dynamics itself. Um, so, and that what you were doing when you were looking at the spikes, then that what, what the, the cell was actually spiking as a function of some um, exceeding a threshold of this, uh, this internal membrane potential oscillation, such that um, whenever the, this 
internal wave um, actually exceeded a threshold that produced a spike. Um, and as it increased in amplitude above that threshold, that produced several spikes. Um, and if you then compare the peaks of this internal membrane potential uh, and the soma potential, <coughs> what you see is that it, the peaks of these internal oscillations move relative to this uh, external LFP. Um, what's nice about this is it actually produces uh, an effect which Mayank doesn't like uh, uh, and has an alternative model for, which is that it, it causes the cell, um, the, 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 the spikes of the cell to actually precess relative to this, uh, this uh, second wave, um, despite the fact that the, the amplitude of the firing is increasing and then decreasing. So if you have a simple model in which the, the movement of the, the cell relative to the uh, external LFP is uh, being driven by the, some internal potential, which is just forcing the firing forward and then uh, relaxing again. You have to explain why it continues, the cell continues to precess, uh, despite the fact that there is um, a, a reduction in firing. Yeah. Since you mentioned it, the answer is right at the bottom in your slide. That uh, really looks symmetric to me. That looks like an asymmetric ramp, which is what was the kind of main finding of that paper, right? It doesn't just wax and wane, it ramps up and then drops rather abruptly, unlike the model. How that abruptly is that? It looks, <laughs> you see that as abruptly, I see that. <laughs> I see, I think you see that as abruptly, I can see it as well. So if, as you the paper, yeah. if you look at the paper, that was the main claim in the abstract. In, in which? In, in, Harvey, in Harvey's paper. That's right. That's exactly the paper. It's highly... Yes, so there, so there certainly is the case that it, this model doesn't take into account um, any, any, um, any change in, in, in the DC potential. Uh, but it certainly, on the other hand, what this paper does show is that, in fact, the internal membrane potential oscillations um, actually do um, process relative to this external field potential, which is not true in your model. No, uh, it's true, actually. Absolutely. I don't see how it's true. It's not true. And that, and in that, in fact, the, uh, the firing of the spikes uh, occur on the peaks of the internal membrane potential oscillation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a, a slightly different question. Suppose that you take an actual recording of the data rhythm. Yeah. Uh, so you have here this beautiful beat picture, but you suppose you take an actual recording of the data rhythm for either the blue or the red, right? And then you... Well, that would be very nice, except that one of them is, no, no, is on, supposed to be inside the cell, so... So, suppose you take an actual recording of the theta rhythm, yeah. and also a recording of a play cell before the red starts to move, right? And then you imagine that, you can you generate similar beautiful beats by taking actual recordings from the theta cell and the play cell, can you generate beats of this sort? Because these are highly idealized sinusoidal yes, of waves. Yes, yes. And of course, one of the arguments against this model is that, you know, uh, these oscillations are going to be much noisier. And that's, that's but there. as you yeah. pointed out, yeah. there's two sorts of noise. The yeah. noise which spoils the phase and the yes. noise which just changes the amplitude. And yes. the second one is yes. not going to spoil the picture, and the first yes. one is. So hence my question, if you take an actual uh, recording from, let me put, let me rephrase it. Suppose you take an actual recording of the theta rhythm and one of the play cells. How close is the phase relationship? Can, is, the, is the noise in the phase sufficient to uh, allow... So, so are you saying, we, are you talking about the data that we already have where we're recording yes. extra... Can you take actual theta recordings of, of, of the theta rhythm and play cells and see if you can produce from such recordings an interference pattern. You mean an intracellular recording? Yes, place. exactly. Yeah, so th there's, there's, there's just very little data on that. Uh, and in fact, well, it's one of the reasons that we've set up the virtual so reality is to be able to actually... To the actually membrane of the play cells yeah. and compare that with the theta rhythm. Yes. Would you then, do you think you then will get beats? Um, Yes, well, I, that's what the model predicts. 
Yes. Yeah, that's what the model but predicts. Based the data are not yet available. To not really. Yet. So this, okay, so the, the the data from from Harvey et al. are are about the best that that. But those uh, are tetro has. data, right? No, no. These are these are intracellular. These are These are the intracellular data. Okay. So data. then you, in principle, you could take that, put it together <laughs> with the theta rhythm, and see if you still have an interference or a beat pattern yeah. as you as you hope for. Yeah. So the thing is outside the play field, they're completely out of phase. And yeah. only the coupling happens within the place field. And yes, that's where exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So you, in principle, if you could record from inside the cell, combine that with mm -hmm. the uh, data rhythm, then that should predict a beat pattern for the LFP Correct. with the tetrode yeah. outside the cell. But and then you could test this, this idea. You could, but well, that depends on how correlated the noise and the, the two frequencies are. If they're correlated, I you I can... I understand, but the question is, can one theoretic, can one experimentally test this idea? Is the noise so bad that it's going to spoil the appearance of beats, because it spoils the face, or is it merely going to uh, make the amplitude, in which case this picture would survive? And it's an experimental question. I've done that extensively, okay. not with the intracellular data, but um, I've done simulations where you apply different, um, so for the dendritic frequency, you assume like correlations between zero and but one. If they're, if they're perfectly correlated, you get to see the beat. It's not a theoretical question I'm asking. I'm asking experimentally. If you do this experiment... Robin, experimentally, it's not that possible to measure There's the no dendritic, dendritic potential. Recording. Uh, no, you don't have no, to. No, 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 no. You would have to assume that the LFP is the dendritic potential. Yes. Yes. Right. Which is an assumption. Yeah. yeah. And but then, you, so you need to take an, an, an intracellular recording and compare it with the data rhythm, and then yeah. see how that how that agrees with the LFP. Yeah. So the first the first r run that was done by in, in Tank's lab by Harvey et al. Um, really did a very simple thing. Just we record the LFP, mm -hmm. uh, the the, M, the MPL, the, the the intracellular membrane potential oscillation, and then look and and, and this is what they saw essentially. This is a, a, a schematic of what they saw, and they saw two things. One, which is that there are these internal oscillations in the membrane potential, which shift relative okay. to, the, um, to the external uh, uh, So the blue LFP. line are, is a membrane? So the blue line is actually the external, um, uh, the external. It's um, a, uh, a beautiful yeah. sine wave. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, the, this is a cartoon. <laughs> this is a cartoon. <laughs> this looks idealized. This is a cartoon, which, which represents, that's a very nice sign you saw it. But look. <laughs> <laughs> we were, they're good very narrow frequency. And this is also a very <laughs> idealized uh, risk. But this looks suspicious, right? Right. I mean, you can't take that serious. That, that, <laughs> that sign. No, because it represents. No, it represents what that. What, what roughly they hope. what they were. No, what they actually. Uh, you they can have probably have some data. I don't. But what they did also find, which is which is dear to Mayang's heart, is that there is a a uh, which is not predicted by this model is that there's a, a depolarizing shift, uh, which pushes the membrane potential closer to. Um, the, the firing threshold, mm -hmm. and that then um, on top of that, the cells are, 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 are synchronized with, with the, the, uh, the oscillations. So it's a kind of, and, and what they've suggested for this and for the, for the granules, uh, for the, the grid cells, is that we're probably looking at some sort of a hybrid model which actually takes into account uh, co components of, of the various, um, various models. So John, would not this model also predict a starting correlation between phase position and time? Right. This is a time-based thing, right? No, because th what I did mention, and I'm just about to mention, is that one of these oscillators, uh, the frequency is, 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 is uh, modulated by the animal speed. As I said yesterday, the, the whole of the... The, 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 omega, the omega T is, is, you need omega X. Yeah, yeah. So the, the whole, the, the, the way in which you, you actually c control for, turn, turn it from a temporal signal into a spatial signal is actually to... to um, to modulate one of the oscillators, uh, make it into a voltage uh, or a, a velocity controlled oscillator, so that it, it's actually changing its frequency as a function of the, of the animal's speed. But and if you get that relationship right, then you can correct for different ones. And that's one of the things you see. One of the, the, the most impressive things about, um, about uh, running uh, lots and lots of trials is you see that there, the, 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 the actual relationship between time is much, much worse because the, 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 um, the, the phase precession takes into account the speed, the different speeds. Uh, and you get the same phase precession essentially if the animal runs very, very slow to the field and very rapidly. Yeah. Would it matter which dendrite the other? If, 
Well, I don't want to go. I don't want to go too too much into the dendrite because yeah. I think they're real, you know the, the biophysicists and the, and the models don't like it because it's it's really quite difficult to reduce this uh, two two different oscillators uh, of different different frequencies in the same the same cell. Maybe the models are wrong. Uh, this is this is more of their stuff, um, and and this is essentially just showing what I what I just said. Okay, so there are lots of problems with this model, um, and uh, you've already heard most of them. Uh, I'll tell you a couple more. <laughs> uh, one is that um, just very soon after this was done, uh, Yuzaki had one of his very good students. Um, Mikhail Zugaro do a rather important experiment in which he, as the animal was running through the field, they injected a, a, a large pulse of current into the hippocampus, which effectively has, uh, blocks all of the activity in the hippocampus. So this is the, the, the physiological analog to what, um, what, um, what you were suggesting here. Um, and then tried to see what happens. And so they wanted to see whether there, in fact, this idea that there's an internal dynamical um, oscillation going on um, survived if you blocked it and, and essentially reset it. Um, and what happened was, uh, surprisingly, and now this was an input into the hippocampus uh, from, from, in fact, the other hippocampus, um, what happened was that the, the phase procession carried on merrily along, despite the fact that they had shut down activity for about 200 milliseconds. So that it looked as though uh, the simple idea that there was an internal oscillator which was just carrying on and producing the phase possession wasn't going to wasn't going to hold up, um, suggesting that maybe the oscillations uh, were at the very least at least one of the oscillators was coming from from uh, somewhere outside of the cells. Um, equally important to my mind, and this always bothers, is that there are in fact uh, multiple fields. This model predicts that there should be multiple fields because. There's no reason to think that there's anything particular uh, privileged about this uh, little wavelet here as opposed to this little wavelet and so on and so forth. And what we did is assume that there was some extra um, uh, input which was actually selecting for this little wavelet, perhaps causing the oscillator only to change frequency at this point. And as mentioned, uh, one simple model is that outside of the place field, uh, these two are, uh, in fact, um, running at the same frequency but 180 degrees out of phase, so they cancel each other. And it's only when something else comes in and says, oh, you're now entering the place field, you know, deus ex machina fashion, but perhaps the environmental cues. Um, that's what the tank paper showed, right? Hmm? They showed that they were. Th that's what they showed, yeah. yeah. That's what they showed. But it still is a kind of, you know, <laughs> at this stage, you would. So, um, and of course, when you see these multiple oscill oscillations, and then you think, well, OK, you have to restrict it for the place field. But if you had multiple oscillations like this, they would fit very nicely for the, for the, the grid cell. And the minute that we saw the grid cells, uh, Neil Burgess and, and Caswell Barry and I uh, decided to, to, um, to um, expand the model and to change the model so that it fit not only for the place cells, but also for the grid cells. The grid cells also show phase precession. Um, and the simplest way to expand the model is to assume that um, these, uh, these oscillators are um, not only controlled by the speed at which the animal is running, but also uh, each oscillator is controlled by the direction in which the animal is running. So that you get um, uh, 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 each of the oscillators is actually signaling how close the animal's direct heading direction is to the preferred direction of that oscillator and also the, the animal speed. And if you do that, you assume that the oscillators have um, different uh, preferred directions, perhaps 60 degrees relative to each other to pick a random number. <laughs> <laughs> then what you see is that each one actually uh, paves the environment with um, these bands uh, and of course, the bands are at 60 degrees relative to each other. And then you can just, uh, if you assume that somehow you can combine these bands, uh, when you put them together, then they, they produce something like grid cells. And, and Neil Burgess has done quite a few simulations which show that it works um, using, using uh, data. Yeah? So can you remind me, what, at the start, you said there was, a, there was this observation, the difference between the linear and the, and the two-dimensional. 
and you said it's an important thing people often just don't talk about it. Can you remind me now what you said? You said that in the two-dimensional version... I was talking mostly about the place cells. And, and it's, but it's also true about the grid cells, to uh -huh. be honest. Um, that w w what I was saying is, is particularly about the directionality of the cells. Yeah. So that if you take a place cell and you record, uh, record from it in a two-dimensional environment, let's say a square box, then it doesn't make any difference, uh, by and large, which direction the animal runs through the place field. Right. So you can run north, you can run south, you can run east, you can run west. And, and, and in, there, are, there are slight um, asymmetries. But in fact, in general, the firing rate is about the same. And the field is about the same. Although I must say that sometimes if you look very carefully, the fields are slightly offset relative to each other. Mm -hmm. um, if you look now at a linear track, by and large, and the animal's running on the linear track. What appears to happen, uh, and I think this is probably correct, um, when the animal first starts running on the linear track, then the, um, and Mike has more, more data on this than we do, but it's just been uh, actually looked at very carefully in Blue Smith Motor. When the animal runs the first couple of trials up and down the uh, linear track, the cell fires in both directions. But then very quickly, it stops firing in one direction. Um, and we just don't understand exactly what that is. Well, I don't understand that. Um, in terms of the grid cells, you see the grid pattern, of course, very nicely in a two-dimensional environment. And the cells can be either directional or non-directional, depending on where you record from them in the internal cortex. How that maps onto the firing of this cell on a linear track is still an open question. Tank thinks he knows how to, as it were, project, because all of his work is done on a linear track. Um, as is all of our work uh, in, in the virtual reality. And he thinks he knows that you can actually take, for example, you can assume that uh, when, when you, the animal is running on a linear track, it's essentially running through a slice of a two-dimensional grid pattern. I'm not convinced. Uh, I'm certainly not convinced. And so what you see is you don't see, for example, very rarely do you see a cell go brup, 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 brup on, on the linear track. What it goes is brup, nothing, nothing, brup, and things like that. And you have, to, you have to assume that actually you're making uh, slices which don't respect the actual... Uh, you don't believe that there are straight lines in this industry? I don't, I don't, that's what you I don't, don't believe that it's a simple straight line. Right now. Wait, uh, and, and, it's not and straight or, or it's not through it's one straight. of the pit's boxes? It's um, straight, right? Sorry? Well, so what you could imagine is that, when you, is that a linear track is just taking a slice, some random slice through, yeah. through this thing. Oh, yeah. okay. It's a random okay. slice. It's still straight. It's just... It's straight. Oh, it's yeah, it is straight. Yeah. And, but that's and pretty easy to do statistics, right? If you know much of random text. We don't have enough data usually to do statistics. So this is just so this was really for him to try and justify the fact that he's um, you know, he's using he's trying to look at grid cells in, in, a, in an environment which is not really. How many grid cells do you have in the linear track so far? Um, with more than with more than two fields. So we haven't we we haven't done a lot of the stuff on the linear track. So in his database, he's got like maybe I think it was twenty twenty five. Oh, that's not too many cells. There's, hmm? Is that enough? With more than two place fields? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Throw down twenty five random things. I mean, yeah, that's definitely enough. Well, you have to, so the way to do it is to actually you know try to try to make the case. And, and, and the, 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 the difficult case to make is if you're recording from several cells at the same time. Well, you said some cells are directional. And then try to say where would, how would you get the patterns that you get on the assumption that you're recording from neighboring grids. And what we know about neighboring grids in, in this two-dimensional environment. So the directionality is the one that's difficult, right? That when Tank measured it and Moser, Moser measured that, as well as your data in Entorhino, the cells are not directional on linear track, meaning they fire pretty much equally at the same place in both directions um, on linear track. Yeah, yeah, but so whatever cut yeah. is being taken is yeah. the same cut in it's both same. directions. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas see yeah. one place cells, they are yes, they are. But yeah. some, some yeah. but what, when we looked at it, actually 50% of C1 cells are bidirectional in the linear track. In linear track. Yeah, that's just you. You have different data from everybody else, Mayang. I don't think so. I think that is exactly this data. Okay. But there's, <laughs> there's, there's a study that shows you know, that the 
amount of directionality that you see depends on uh, how many uh, hues exactly. you have yeah. in the track. So yeah. Exactly. So you, I think depending, yeah, but he, depending exactly. on the yeah, But even if you put lots and lots of cues on it, and of course that totally changes the animal behavior and everything, yeah. uh, it still doesn't come in near close to 50%, I don't think. No, that's what Battaglia and McNaughton also showed. And they had only four cues on the track, not lots. The behavior was the same. Actually, they compared behavior Without cues and with behavior, with cues. So why does that? So why does that make a difference? What? Because what? the proximal cues are driving cells. That's the hypothesis. Yeah. They put proximal cues, and more cells become active, and they are bidirectional. Okay. But it is correct that the 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 proportion of directional cells varies a lot across labs. So there's no there's no doubt about that. In yeah. some labs, it's uh, you know very high. So. Yeah over 50% even occasionally, and in other labs it's, it's, very, it's very low, so, and I, you know, yeah, and it's I, one of those things. And I, I, I prefer that they were all non-directional. <laughs> <So. laughs> I hate the idea that they sell stop firing in one direction. We, we've tried that, haven't been able to get them to come back and be bi-directional, by the way, by putting all sorts of, I, once they become directional, it seems like they have stuck. In, in that direction. Why, why is this not just a contextual remapping like any other? So the, the rat learned that black box is different from the white box, and 50% of the flesh cells remap, and the good cells shift almost imperceptibly. Well, what's the conception? What's the context context shift? The context shift is running that way versus running that way. Yes. So because you've, you've, yeah, you've taken right. an environment and you've you've naturally created two discriminable situations for the rat. Yeah, but why doesn't that happen? So the question is why, yeah, I agree, but why doesn't that happen in a, um, in a, in a two-dimensional environment? Because it doesn't because easily parse into two environments. Yeah, you haven't split it into going that way versus going this way. In fact, I think if you do force a rat in an open environment, so you have a stereotype Yeah, that does happen. Yeah. 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 So, so presumably the system is trying to isolate discoverable situations. Mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't that predict that fewer cues would make it less likely to be unidirectional? Fewer cues you have, the more likely it would be to be unidirectional. Sorry, the fewer cues you have. Fewer cues. So if you want, if you want it, so so few cues, it forget which context it is. That's when you see bidirectionality. Well, then so you get these distance cells. Yeah, then you get distance cells. Where, where the, the, so the that's that a separate different. story. Yeah. Then the cells stop responding to place, they start responding to distance. But you're saying that the, the, the experimental observation is that if you put more cues in, you're more likely to get bi bidirectional cells. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. It's just more, cause more cues, yeah, the more they know it's. But also depends but on what kind of cues. This was a mess of cues? Proximal or local cues. <laughs> How about a different campus? It's all this data, right? <laughs> it's all these observations keep getting in the way of the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, we've spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time, in, 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 there's several people in the lab, mostly Caswell and Barry, trying, trying to see whether some of the things that come out of this idea, that changes in frequency of either the, the firing, um, os the oscillatory activity of the cells or the, the theta activity, um, can actually um, relate to um, some aspect of the grid cells. And particularly, the model predicts that as you change the frequency of, of one of these oscillators, um, that should affect, for example, the spacing of the grids. And there are several ob observations which, um, so it's a productive model. It actually makes predictions and it says what kind of experiments you should do. So one of the nicest ones is, is this observation by, by um, Caswell Barry that if you record from the grids in a familiar environment, um, uh, then what you get is what the Moses have always reported, is that the grids are stable and they stay, and, and, and the actual scale of the grid stays stable uh, across trials. But that if you place the animal uh, in between these recordings in, in a familiar environment, you place it into a novel environment, um, which is a similar shaped box, but with different colors and smells and things like that, that it produces a, a very, very profound effect on the grid structure. First of all, the grids become a little bit messier. Uh, but most importantly, what happens is that the, the, the scale increases. 
so that if you look here, what you see is that here's a grid uh, produced in, in, in this familiar box. Um, here's the same grid produced in another trial, uh, several trials later in the same box. But in between, if you put the animal into this unfamiliar environment, what you see is that the scale expands uh, in the new environment. So that tells us, uh, and that what happens then is that slowly, and, it, and the expansion is quite a, quite a large cha change, uh, and then over successive trials, as this new box becomes familiar, the scale um, regresses back to the original canonical size. What's so the percentage the, change? Hmm? What's the percentage change? It, it varies from, from one animal to, 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 to the other. Um, and, um, yes, we can see it on, on one on the left, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it can be as high as uh, 20, uh, 40%. It can be as high as 40%. It can be as low as 10, 10%. It, it, it varies from, from uh, one, one, one animal to the other. Um, but over time, it slowly comes back to the original scale. And that happens within a day, and it happens across days. Um, so Caswell, um, and I guess I agree to some extent, although I'm still a little skeptical about this, because I really do like the idea that the grids are providing some sort of universal metric. Um, Caswell thinks that this, and, and Neil Burgess also think that this is acting as a kind of a familiarity signal. So that the change in the scale of the grids, and as I'll show you in a second, the change in the, in the uh, LFP that's recorded at the same time, um, are actually reflecting the novelty or the familiarity of the environment. Is this this is a little uncomfortable because <laughs> we would really like this not to happen. Is the change in scale discrete or continuous? Mm -hmm. So if, as the animal gets more familiar, does the scale shrink steadily, or does it jump back from the top to the bottom? Well, yeah, question. Well, uh, so it, 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 it looks continuous, but um, you know, given, that, um, given what we know what about the grids and the, and the quantization yeah, of it, exactly. uh, we don't think that there's enough data to be able to separate between those two, uh, those two possibilities. So it might go in quantum. Um, we probably have the data, or Cal has the data, but we haven't, haven't uh, addressed that question. It's a good question. And as um, interestingly enough, uh, for the relationship between the, um, the grid cells and the play cells, concomitant with that um, expansion, um, as shown here, you get a, a, a play cell. Okay, so in the original uh, familiar environment, here's a cell that fires in the south here, and then during in this new environment, um, it remaps, um, and then um, it slowly reverts. Uh, over time, uh, I don't think, actually I don't think there's enough data to say that it reverts back to the original uh, play cell representation. So and how, how does this fit with Wilson and Norton's observation that the null element, the play cells actually grow? Isn't that? It's like 1993, the first, this big multi electrode recording paper where they claim so that's kind of, yeah, that, that wasn't, I mean, this, that's really not comparable. I, mean, I think when, when people write about novel and, and familiar environments, you have to read the paper very, very carefully to see exactly what they're talking about. Um, and my understanding is that, for example, in the, in, and, and Stefan, you can, you can tell me about this, in, in the, in what counts as a novel in a familiar environment in, in, the, in the Moser lab um, might not necessarily be a, a box that the animal's never seen before. Whereas we're talking about, when we talk about a novel, this is a situation that the animal's never, ever seen before. Uh, well, I mean, they did some studies, you know, early on where they just switched between two environments. Yes. So they were yes. both somewhat yes. familiar. Yes. And there you don't see the expansion. Yes, that's, that's right. That's so that the original idea was that, that, that you didn't, or they were relatively familiar, or relatively, relatively novel. In the McNaughton and Wilson study, um, what they did was they had a box, which the an and the animal was uh, originally confined to one half of the box, and then they just removed the, uh, the partition so that the animal. Would. But that's a situation in which the animal really—it's not totally novel. The animal has really got a, a lot of the same, the same information, the same cues. Um, uh, but by the way, there is a slight um, expansion of the in this. If, if what, that's what you're asking. There is a slight expansion of the place heel size in, in this in, uh, experiment as well. And um, as the model would predict, 
at the same time as there's this change in the, in the, um, in the scale of the grids, there's a change in the, um, in the LFP, um, LFP frequency. And you can see here in the, in the familiar environment, um, it's, uh, the firing uh, frequency is about 8.89 hertz, whereas in the novel environment, it reduces to about 8.4, 8.5. What would the typical phase of firing of the precepts compared to guitar? So these are, so of course, um, that's, a, that's a hard question because these are done in two-dimensional environments. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I made it clear that to, a lot of the work on, on phase is done in a, a single uh, linear uh, track uh, or one-dimensional environment. Um, it, it occurs in two-dimensional environments, um, but it's much more difficult to extract the, the, the phase relationship. So I don't know the answer to, to that question. Um, in a novel environment, uh, Colin Lever has shown that there is a shift in, in preferred phase uh, of the plate cells. Um, they fire earlier on the phase than the, than the, than the old one. But, um, it's, it's not easy to, to get good, reliable data in those experiments. Now, in this LFP <coughs> thing that you see across the Yep. Do you oh, these are cross trials. Cross trials. Yeah. Uh, these are cross trials. It's it's small, but it's about the right. Fine. It's about but the right. Was it controlled? The running speed was controlled. Yeah. Or? Yeah. So it was not that yeah. novel environment. The animal was just yeah. Slow. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're pretty. We we um we usually subsample the, the the data to to equate the running speed. It's it's an obvious thing you have to worry about, and and certainly when you put the animal into a new, new environment, it, there there are there are differences. Um, but uh, we, we always take that into account. Um, and this, this, this occurs in the cells as well. So you can look at, at grid cells and show there's a correlation between um, the, the frequency, inter in, intrinsic firing frequency, and the, and the grid cell scale. So the, the relationships actually uh, seem to hold up, at least on, on those cells. I was going to talk a little bit about Stefan's uh, work, which, um, but I'm going to, to let him uh, talk about it because he's going to give this. But it's another demonstration that the LFP activity in, in, in the hippocampus and the entomological cortex seems to be, it's all correlational stuff, but it seems to have some vital role in the construction of, of the grid representations. Yeah? If we go back to the previous slide, yeah. so there is a correlation. Um, is the slope of this correlation compatible with what the model would uh, predict? Um, I'm not sure that we've looked that carefully at, 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 uh, at, 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 at the details of it. So there's obviously, as, as you can see, there's a, there's a correlation, but um, whether how, how good these things will, will fit uh, in, in a quantitative way. Uh, General, even the magnitude of the change in the frequency? Yes, the, 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 yeah, the yes, so qualitatively, yes. But I'm certainly not holding uh, forth the idea that, that this is, is going to hold at, a, at a, an exact quantitative level. It's not physics. So, um, so what Stefan uh, and, and, and Koenig and, and, and colleagues did was they showed that if you block septal, um, the medial septum, which of course is the source of, of many of the inputs into the hippocampus, as I said yesterday, which provide, um, say, the cholinergic drive, which produces the, these uh, beta oscillations, um, you can really knock down the power of, of theta in, 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 in both the hippocampus and, and the uh, entorhinal cortex. And um, what that does is it knocks out the grid cell pattern. And I'll leave Stefan to tell you a lot more about this. Uh, it just disintegrates. Um, and you can show this by looking at the gridness score here. Um, it also knocks the firing rate down a little bit. This is a short-term lidocaine block, which is, what, 10, 15 uh, minutes worth of, of, of block. Um, interestingly enough, and this is a evidence, I think, which is um, pretty good evidence that the, the place cells are not totally dependent on the grid cell. But interestingly, uh, at the same time, there's some effect, but very, very uh, much less of an effect on the place cells. Have you done behavioral experiments during lidocaine block? See if there are deficits? Yeah, there's a whole history of looking at the effect of, of blocking lidocaine. And it, it does look as though it has an effect on, on some some aspects of spatial learning and spatial memory, but it's it's not clear. So that 
that's part of it. it's it's a very, very messy literature. and you should you should address this more towards Stefan, but it's a really messy literature of, uh, in terms of what it what it does affect in terms of spatial behavior and spatial memory and what it doesn't affect. And I suspect that it's the beginnings, and we think uh, that it's the beginnings of 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 dissecting out the various strategies that animals can use to to um, to address the spatial system. In other words, if if you could, produce pure environmental navigation uh, um, tasks as opposed to internal path integration navigation tasks. I think you begin to see some sense of this. And I suspect, w w I guess we, and I don't know what Stefan thinks about this, he'll tell you. We would say that if you do this theta block, then you're going to knock out the path integration system and you're going to leave, uh, say, place recognition. So the animal walks around and he says, oh, I know where I am because I can see, see the cues. But if he has to actually navigate using some sort of path integration system, then he won't. Is there, has there been any attempts to mode lock the theta rhythm? That is, if you put the head of the red under an AC external potential with 10 hertz or whatever it is, is it possible to mode lock the theta rhythm? I think you'd have trouble getting it published. <laughs> it's probably an interesting experiment. You'd probably have trouble getting it published and, and convincing people that it was the theta that you were affecting and not, not the rest of the brain. Yeah. I'll be talking about You can do it optogenetically. Yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you could shift systematically the theta rhythm and see. Yeah. yeah. Or change the frequency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah no, the, and, and it's, it is surprising. I, I'm, another thing I've been resistant to is the idea that you could use optogenetics to change in some meaningful way the frequency of these, these potentials. Because uh, it is a complicated system. Or we would call these big, nice oscillations. But when you look into the physiology of it, it's actually rather complicated as to what's happening at the, at the single cell level. The other thing that I think is important is that um, I guess um, you'll allow me to call these boundary cells? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I noticed it's not along the, the border, is it? <laughs> oh, it's, it's the, the bound, these boundary cells are, are, are also survive. So uh, it's, it's a really, it's a very, very nice observation. I think it's very, very important to, to, to be congratulated. Okay, let me uh, spend the last couple of minutes telling you about what I just suggested earlier, um, uh, yesterday. Um, to, to give you some idea of how we think at least one way of, of, of interpreting the grid cell um, phenomenon um, should, be, should be looked at. So if you think of the, 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 the idea that there are all these um, plane waves or that, that any uh, grid pattern, um, canonical grid pattern, can be decomposed into a series of, of, of uh, using two-dimensional Fourier spectral analysis into uh, sets of, of uh, plane waves at, at, uh, and, and, and represented by this spatial, um, the, this 2D uh, Fourier spectrum here, then um, it, it suggests that, um, so this is a standard thing where the, um, let me see if I get this right, it's shown here, the actual, um, the actual location of these, of these, uh, of these uh, colored dots here um, represents the um, the angle represents the direction of the plane wave. So this one is represented by this. The, um, the, uh, the distance from the center uh, represents the, the, the frequency of the plane wave. And um, the, uh, the, the color represents the actual uh, power. So for example, a, a standard uh, grid cell would be represented by this kind of a plot, showing that there are three uh, different uh, components, three different spectral components at about um, 60 degrees relative to each other. That suggests that you might then uh, go and look at other cells because the, the, the grid cells are only a small part of, I'll show you a small percentage of the cells in the antrinal cortex. It suggests that there may be other cells there which don't show the nice grid pattern, but which could be also similarly decomposed by using this analysis. And so um, Yulia Krupic um, undertook that uh, and in fact, this was her idea, uh, and she undertook that analysis. So in addition to grid cells, as shown here, um, she uh, saw, and particularly um, in, the, in the paracivicular area, she saw a whole bunch of cells which are spatially periodic, but really aren't grid cells. So if you look at the, uh, the grid scores here, 
Um, and usually some, anything above 1.23 1, 1. is, is a, a very good grid pattern, it, and it reflects how symmetrical and, and hexagonal the, the, this, this distribution is here, um, and how easy it is to fit uh, a, 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 a template onto it. These cells, um, they show some sort of nice patterns, but they're clearly not set out in this hexagonal array. And their grid scores are pretty lousy. They're way down below anything that you'd expect from a respectable grid cell. They are stable. So from one trial to the next, they show a nice repeatable pattern. Another. And some of them look like they're more stripy and more oriented in one direction, uh, reflecting, uh, and this is easy to see in the autocorrelogram, suggesting that they're composed of primarily one uh, of, these, of these Fourier components, uh, and, and that it dominates the pattern more than, uh, than the rest. Um, and if you do look at the, uh, the, the spectral analysis, you see this very nice uh, three-component spectral analysis for, for the grids. Hmm? And, but if you look at these other ones, then although they might have the same number of components, um, they're sometimes dominated by one, one component, and they are not necessarily showing this, this symmetrical pattern, but sometimes they're, they're, they're elongated. And some of them show really only two, one, one or two, um, two uh, dominant components, as you could see, as you'd expect from just looking at this data. And then, of course, there are a lot of other cells which just are crap. They're not really doing anything. Do you know the fraction of these three? Yeah, I'll show you. Uh, oh, well, I'll show you at least uh, a, some, some analysis of it. So if you look at the grid cells and you ask how many components they have, then most of them, as you'd expect, have three components. There are a few with, uh, sneak in here with either two or four. But these other ones show a much wider distribution of components. They certainly, some of them have three components, but some of them have only one, and some have two. And some have four. Um, in terms of the proportion, it turns out that um, the, uh, if you take both the grids and these um, spatially periodic cells together as a class, they account for a large percentage, 70% of all the cells that are recorded in this, this particular area, the parasympathetic and the antimonial cortex. And in fact, these non-grid spatially periodic cells are more dominant. There's 43% of the cells are, are in that class, and, and only 35% are in the grids. So we're thinking, now I should say, that the grids are special. They're more stable. So if you look either within a day or across days in terms of the stability, you see that the grids show a higher correlation between the patterns across uh, the trials than these non-grid uh, cells here. But you can see they're really quite, quite, uh, quite respectable in terms of their stability across it. Um, and of course, they're both much better than these, um, these uh, the junk cells, as I call them. Uh, and that's either within the session or across days. And that's partly because of the stability of the Fourier uh, components. The components are pretty, pretty stable. We think they may be just one big class of cells and that there's, there's something special about the stability of the grid cells, but we think that these other cells could probably do all of the work, as you'd expect, the minute you start going into the Fourier uh, domain. They could do all of the work that we're, we're asking the grid cells to do. And one or two rather interesting observations that you have made uh, really are suggestive of that. Sometimes you see cells change from one day to the next, and we're pretty sure, we're never absolutely sure you've got the same cell, we're pretty sure they're the same cell from a grid cell to one of these non-grid cells. And if you do the, the, the Fourier spectral analysis, what it looks like is that what you've done is you've lost, you've maintained one of the components, one of the, 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 uh, the plane waves, and you've lost the other two. And that occurs spontaneously, but it also occurs if you switch between uh, environments that, as it were, forces this, this change. So we think it may be the case that, uh, that the, these are really all just one par part of a, a big complex of cells. Another thing is that if you look at the components in, um, in a, the same animal, what you see is that, uh, as you'd expect in the black shown black here, um, the, um, the grid cells all have very similar uh, components. And they all can be composed into the same uh, three uh, dominant uh, Fourier components. But if you look at these other ones, they show a very strong similarity in the components to which they can be decomposed as well. 
is shown, for example, here. As you can see, there's a kind of a rough relationship between the three grid cell components here and the, uh, the three red ones here. Um, the relative, uh, there's, they do, however, have a much more broader uh, relationship in terms of the, the, the angles between them. The grid cells tend to have a 60 degree separation between them, whereas these have a much broader spectrum. So the, the story isn't complete, but there is at least the, the suggestion there that what you're looking at is a system um, which is, is actually providing the, 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 the Fourier components. Sometimes they come together to make this very nice grid pattern, and there's probably something very special about that. I'm certainly not trying to dis the, the grid cells. There's something very important about it. But that, um, but that many of the things that we assume they can do, for example, summing together to produce grid cells, could be done by these other cells uh, equally well. OK, I've run over time. But um, there are a lot of problems with wave interference theory or the oscillatory interference model. Uh, I think you've heard most of them. And maybe Mike will think of a few more to throw at it, at it uh, in, in, in the, the next couple of weeks. Um, but it certainly is very suggestive. It gives a role to the theta oscillations. And most theories, for example, none of the attractive networks give very much of a, a, a crucial role to it. They just say, oh, it's there, so maybe it has some effect on, on some aspect of another. But there's no intrinsic uh, reason for this system, which <coughs> and this is not something you see in lots and lots of parts of the brain. Uh, the, the system looks like it's built to actually produce those oscillations. Um, um, as you can see from the, the slides from, from Stefan's uh, experiment, there's a whole part of the brain, the medial septum, which is there to produce those oscillations. Um, so it needs to have a function, and uh, it certainly provides uh, at least one possible function for it. Um, so if you use the speed modulation of one frequency, uh, and uh, I, you turn these into to, to VCONs, voltage control oscillators, then that uh, it helps to explain changes in spatial scale. It makes it very easy to change spatial scale by just changing the oscillators. Um, and you can show how it works in two dimensions. Um, and lastly, the grid cells may be, uh, and probably are very important, uh, but they may be only one type of cell in the entorhinal cortex which uses this type of, of system. And finally, um, Neil Burgess has and, and Caswell have done most of the, 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 the computational work. Caswell uh, has done a lot of very nice experimental work on what happens to grid cells in, in novel environments. Uh, he's also looked at the effect of changing the aspect ratio of boxes on, on the grid structure. Um, and Julia has also been doing that. And one of the things that she's been showing is that the, the, even within a single environment, the scale of the grids can be modified by changing the shape of the, of the, of the, of the box. So we're, we're we're beginning to appreciate how important the, 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 the actual shapes of the box are in, con in constructing that grid pattern. Uh, I think something which was um, under under appreciated until that. And Yulia was the one who came up with the idea of actually using two-dimensional Fourier spectral analysis to decompose the decompose cell. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> question about this uh, moving backwards. You know, so the other theory is that if you move backwards, it will really get a uh, phase process instead of phase yeah, prism. Wrong. Okay. It's wrong. Like a yeah. So, <laughs> so you have to have some way to prevent it from happening. You have to somehow uh, some additional rule to say that you cannot recruit oscillator that uh, that changes in the opposite it. direction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can just you can just put it in by hand. <laughs> but it certainly is true. So we've done it in virtual reality. Just a quick look, uh, and I you can run the animal very easily backwards. But um, it's been done in um, in the Collège de France uh, lab uh, and. Um, by having run animals run on a cart where they, they're running, the cart is going in the opposite direction that they're running and things like that. And phase procession always goes in the same direction. So the, 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 the voltage control oscillator always increases and never, never decreases below the baseline oscillator, if, if, if that's what we're looking at. So you're absolutely right. You, you need to have some way in which uh, you prevent it from, from, uh, from going down. 
and that at SFN I was talking to this guy Zugaro's lab. Yeah. And they also see the place will asymmetry flip. Yeah. And it goes backward the asymmetry two flips. Yeah. So what do you think of that? I think whether you mean whether you mean the whether the, 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 the field is symmetrical or not. No, field is asymmetric. Yeah. When he's going forward, the asymmetry is this way. Yeah. And the precession is going this way. Yeah. When I he think goes backward, the asymmetry flips and precession flips. Yeah. I, I do think, think whether you see whether you see uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical fields varies uh, again uh, 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 a lot. I mean, we in general we see symmetrical fields. Depends on how you define the field and things like that. They tended to define the field a lot closer to the way you define it. Um, whereas. Um, when I looked at their data, I, I got the impression that they were less asymmetrical than they were, were saying that they were. How yeah, is the external exam? The difference is basically on the threshold, right? Yes, if you have an asymmetric exactly, distribution, exactly. Yeah. it depends on how low the tail is. asymmetry is going to yeah. go down. It, it depends on what you, how you define a place for those and, and, and what, what you do with all of those spikes which you're firing randomly yeah. or, or, or not so randomly. I'd like to ask about how you think about noise in the system. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a computational neuroscientist. Okay, I don't let, think of let, noise. Let, let noise doesn't to, exist in my world. Okay, <laughs> let, let me try to explain what, what seems to me to be a difficulty with these models. And try, I, I want to understand how you think about how this could be resolved. So the, if we look at the set oscillation, it's really not a pure sine wave. No. And if we would follow its phase in time, it could, could kind of wander around uh, relative to what it would be if it was a your sign, right? So it, it depends on what we're talking about. Are you talking about the internal membrane potential oscillations? Well, I'm talking about LFP because that's something that we can, that you can measure. I can't measure it, but you can measure it. <laughs> well, we, um, um, I'm just, yes, OK. OK, so I mean, empirically, it's not a phase that just increases with time linearly. It wanders around and it does yes. stuff. Yes. Now, now in the model, you need to have another oscillation which its own phase changes relative to the first one, but it has to do so in a coordinated manner, because yes. otherwise the whole thing won't work. Yes. So yes. How, do you have some more specific thoughts about mechanism? What could give rise to these two different oscillations, which are noisy? Each one of them is noisy, but they're somehow coordinated in a very special manner. Right? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm not quite sure what you're asking. So if, if you assume, as we, as we mentioned earlier, that they're, they're always there, but they're 180 degrees out of each other, even if they're noisy, that there's some. Um, but they're not just 180 degrees, because you have one oscillation which is, say, not modulated by velocity, and the other one is modulated by velocity. So its phase relative to the first one is constantly changing. Right? It's much, it, yeah. In, in response to motion. But nevertheless, the first one is, is noisy, so the second one has to be equally, the equally noisy. <laughs> equally noisy, but in the same manner. But still so be influenced by speed. speed, whereas the other one doesn't get influenced by mm -hmm. speed. I think that's his yeah. question. Yeah. How can you do both? You can phase lock them, but if you phase lock them too tightly, you yeah, can't make them out the same problem so as you've got And if you attractors. phase lock them too weakly, then yep. they get defaced the by noise. Let me, let me rephrase this question as a statement. This is, <coughs> this is an incredibly fragile mechanism. Yeah. And it's so fragile that it stretches the imagination. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> I don't know how correlated the noise and the frequencies are. <coughs> if the noise and the frequencies are correlated, like up until, I don't know, like 0.4.5, which could be feasible if it's the same theta rhythm going to the soma and also a dendrite, and then that dendrite somehow increases its frequency. So you can think of some sort of correlation <coughs> going on because the initial theta feeding to both are the same. So I as long as as long as that correlation. I think the point he's making is that then how would you get one guy to depend on speed and the other to be not dependent on speed? Well, that I can imagine a ramp. Sure, you can you can think of lots of ways in which you can do that. You've got two things well, like one this, and one of them is get gated by speed, and one of them isn't. So, that's well, that's well, the least part. I mean, I think Peter's thing is important. The initial reason has to be right, and the answer has to be right for these three oscillators all to be in sync. I mean, it's it's it's. So which it's model are you talking about? You're talking about the place cell model or the grid cells? Grid cells. For grid well, cells, it's trickier because you have to have yeah, like constant coherence. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. No. I agree. It's trickier. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. I mean, has anybody, for instance, built a network model of this? I mean, it seems like this is begging. We know enough now that that that, that it should be doable, right? Because it seems it's 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 going to be hard. It's going to be hard no matter what you do. I mean, a network model is going to be hard as well for all the reasons you heard. Yeah. I think Haslamo has built uh, network models yeah. that perform uh, oscillatory yeah. interference. So it gets it gets better if you if you yeah. build, put it into a, if you put the oscillators into yeah. networks and have them support each other, then it gets it gets better. I think the, the problem is that we know that there are these internal intracellular membrane potentials, and that they are moving outside of the uh, of the the overall field potential, which must represent some summation of the oscill the oscillatory behavior of lots and lots of cells. So you can ignore that, but it turns out that that's driving the cell. That actually is driving the cell. It's a combined, a signal which is a combined depolarization, as, as was shown, and, and, and that's certainly true. But that it, on top of that but depolarization I mean, if you got, yeah, is, is an oscillation. Right, but if you got rid of the oscillation, you'd have depolarization, you'd have, you'd have spikes, and everything would work out pretty well. And you'd see place fields and good fields, and everything would be fine. Yeah, I'll just let, well, we could get rid of all of the phenomena. <laughs> <laughs> now you talk my language. <laughs> Yeah, you could get yeah, but then you wouldn't have to explain it, right? No, no, but there's still a the problem. This right? is this is an ob these are yeah. observations. So yeah, but, that's what but we're trying to explain is what. There's what no compelling evidence that the oscillations are important for anything, right? For anything. Mm -hmm. Are they? Uh, the, uh, there's, there's all the intercellular <laughs> data, and, 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 and we have some similar data, which there's is that they're they're actually driving this this, this, this spike. If you, well, there. If you take them away, the spikes go away. No. I mean, so well, nobody's right. done nobody's done that yet. So I, take, it's not clear how you do. I mean, you, lost, you, can, you can take oscillations away, depolarize still a little bit, and everything will work out just fine, right? You get the same. You I doubt it. I doubt it. I don't. I mean, Stefan's experiment showed that when you block theta oscillation, cells still spike, and see even place cells have decent place fields too, right? So those things mm, work out. But they don't show. But they don't show the grid now. Yes. So that's what we're trying to explain. How? What's the relationship? So, sorry, Mr. Ed, what didn't show the grid for that? Well, I said well, he didn't you say it. <laughs> why don't, yeah, why don't you tell? <laughs> well, it, you know, <coughs> suggests you know that the place fields don't depend on on oscillatory uh, in interference. That's right. right. Does, yeah. does the phase precession persist for the place fields after you do this block? So there's no theta. There's nothing to process. Oh, right. right. So, yes. so is the what happens? So, what happens if the red moves past the place field if you block the theta rhythm? Place field persists. The place field persists. But do you get so do you get bursting in the cells? Yeah. Theta yeah. Do you so get, the you get, you get the the what, what, what happens with the, what happens with the firing of that particular cell? Mm -hmm. that the theta modulation of the cell decreases substantially. Yeah. And I don't yeah, I don't know whether there's enough remaining to test this. What about the spiking autocorrelation? Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It decreases but the, the cells still stay uh, some cells stay theta modulated. So uh, I should also say, you know, you, you saw from the figure you know, that the theta doesn't go to zero, it goes to twenty percent, thirty percent. So so, so there might be, uh, it's actually on, on our to-do list uh, of, of analysis that we want to do in, in the lab on the data we already acquired to, to, to look at that. We actually have now, we, we repeated this experiment, we reproduced our data with Massimo instead of uh, lidocaine. Mm -hmm. So, and a main advantage with Massimo is that it does not have as much of an effect on firing rate. So the firing rate of the place cells is actually not reduced. So now with these new data, we can actually do this analysis much more, much more effectively, uh, because the in the other data, you know, the decrease in firing rate would actually be a major confound in in, in doing the in doing the analysis. So, um, so I, I I don't know the answer to this uh, to this yet. So. so how would how would you explain? Any, any of the phenomena, how would you, how would, how would you explain mm -hmm. that sort of thing? Which phenomena? Well, say, say, all say yeah, knocking, well, <laughs> not, <laughs> <laughs> knocking out data. Knocking out data. Have no so wait, knocking out data has no effect on analysis? No, it should, that's presumably. No, look, I'm not saying it does, I'm just saying I don't see any super compelling evidence that, that it's important for, for behavior. Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't be surprised if it's important for behavior. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I, you know, it's, it's so ubiquitous, but the, the evidence really isn't, if you think about it, that compelling. There's lots of 
evidence that's involved in stuff. Yeah. Um, but knocking out with that, with that kind of other things, of course, is really hard, right? But yeah, one of the yeah, things, that's you, the problem, that's things the that you knock out is the, just the cholinergic inputs. So, mm -hmm. right. so that is really the old Vincent experiment. We don't know that it's mm -hmm. the oscillatory component of that and not just yeah. the neurotransmitter. Yeah, so knocking out the, 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 the cholinergic component really knocks the, the amplitude of the wave down. But there's still, I think, except this point, the very good one, you know, just because you're not the amplitude down. So the, the oscillatory, the, the, the ACH input, actually. But you can still have oscillation at the cellular level without, without uh, having a big, big signature at that okay, so But I think this is key, you know, that the oscillations persist to some degree, but they're, they're, they're no longer coordinated. Yes. You know, so yes. because they're not coordinated, you don't see a signal at, in extracellular space mm -hmm. yes. anymore. So I think that's. Uh, no, coordinate mean losing phase coherence. That's what you mean. But not yeah. coordinate. Yeah. Well, the, the I mean at the you know in these recordings, if you look at uh, at the pyramidal cells, you know they individually they show uh, state of modulation. But my assumption is, and I actually I, we haven't explicitly tested that. My assumption is, you know, that the, that there's less synchrony between the mm -hmm. between yeah. the individual cells. And that you know that uh, reduces the the signal that you record, you know, the population signal that you record uh, as an LFP. But that will certainly spoil an, an a wave <coughs> interference interpretation if you could still do play cell uh, uh, location. Uh, no, only only the half of it, which suggests. The yeah. So, so, so the, the the general idea. Is it would support you. If that destroys the grid cells, which I understand it does, yes, right? Yeah. Then that would support your grid cell superposition because apparently it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. But the play cell yeah. seems to still work, which yes. suggests that something else. You know, as I suggested yesterday, there are really two ways to create a play cell. Yeah. But the yeah, play cells. That's why I pointed out that there that the 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 um, the boundary vector cells, if you want to call them that, the boundary cells, the ones that fire in this, um, in this uh, 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 like a slab from a distance from the wall, are, are still there. So they're still there to provide that information. So you can have this model which there, where there are two uh, independent ways to do signals. But you showed that, uh, or some of your pictures showed that if you knocked out the grid cells, the place cells were still there, but yep. they were in a slightly different position. As if somehow the grid cells contributed to what they were doing, but um, so they're not. They're not in the same position. Those are different. You had some pictures. They were different cells. The 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 No, those were two different cells. That was not the same. Sorry, sorry, I I didn't describe both. So yeah, okay. So those are different. So an individual cell didn't shift position, play cell, but the knockout of data. Well, that's. Stephanie's data. So no, they, they don't shift uh, their yeah. position. So that I mean, you can show this analytically on you know, that uh, there's no more uh, difference than in a control uh, experiment. So. Yeah. so if one of the oscillator changes its speed dependence, let's say LFP, we know theta, LFP theta <coughs> does depend on running speed. Yeah. yeah. And if that dependence is destroyed. Would the interface model predict phase precession will change or not? Ah, uh, yes, I'm sure it would. Yeah. So unfortunately, we didn't find that. Yeah. So you in virtual reality, we saw. We just see that we We have data. I mean, it's not interpretation; yeah. it's numbers from 2,000 cells. You see, uh, when you get dependence, you talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So speed dependence of theta frequency is gone. Phase precession zero significant. Okay, Mike. <laughs> but so, the, but this, so this is speed that. dependence of. No, I'm just asking. Is it a bit? No, but this. So this is speed dependence of LFP. LFP theta frequency. Yeah. So because the the speed dependence of the of the of the spiking still has to be there. I'm yeah. I'm assuming. That's why I was asking John yeah. whether the so speed dependence of LFP theta frequency makes a difference. So it's the difference between the two the two frequencies mm -hmm. that's important. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of them is speed dependent. Let's oh, say they both be speed dependent. Yes, so but as long as they have a different gate. But, yeah. but, but I mean, that's, and in see, fact, that's more likely because one yes. does see changes. Yes, the right. fact that you see change, a speed and change in the uh, in the extracellular LFP uh, means that the, what you're assuming is that they're both changing the, 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 the spiking. Uh, 
deep tendency is trading. See, the spiking is a result of everything, right? When you measure the spiking of a cell, no matter which, which model you're talking about, the spiking is the result of all kinds of oscillators, attractors, everything. It's the net output. Mm -hmm. So, of That's course, if there is phase precession as a function of position, by definition, it is feed dependent. So that's not saying too much. What matters is the ingredients. The ingredients are two. One ingredient that everybody uses, the local field potential. And we interpret the whichever way we want. That local field potential is the clock with respect to which everything is calculated. Yeah. That local field potential frequency depends on running speed. Yeah. Lots of people have shown that. We see that too in the real world. In virtual reality, the speed dependence of that clock is abolished. Still, the spiking output in terms of precession is identical. Now, there's this big unknown, the other thing, dendrite, network, whatever else it is, membrane potential, we don't know. But what I, my question is this, that no matter who does this experiment, LFP is the clock. LFP speed frequency changes with speed in the real world. Mm -hmm. in everybody's hands mm -hmm. and everybody sees phase precession in the real world the major change we see is that in the virtual world phase precession is intact the speed dependence of the lfp clock is gone and still precession is intact and i find that a little mysterious to reconcile okay. with this i, well, I, I can say so. i mean i can say i think i you know I, the I agree that the difference is, is important and I, you know, we have data now when we artificially drive data. We can actually drive it to, uh, let's say, 10 hertz instead mm -hmm. of 8 hertz. Yeah. And uh, and phase precession remains intact even. So where is that other source of oscillator? So Shouldn't the other oscillator still care for 8 hertz? So Why would it go now at 10 hertz if there is another we oscillator? The, if, we, if we had the other oscillator, then the whole thing would be a lot easier because then we could actually. The problem is we can only see one oscillator. But and I'm then saying we see the spike in the cell, so we have to um, infer. Yeah. So but this, that's a hypothesis, right? The, the other hypothesis. oscillator yeah. really has a certain natural tendency to go in her So it's the same. So the fact that whether the cell is also shift is actually two hertz. Right. Okay. Well, it will make a difference. To some extent, on where you are on the curve. Yeah. So you could set that to zero dependency, and then as long as the 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 um, so the, the second other, oscillator changes in the right way. Mm -hmm. So the second oscillator has to now, going back to the discussion we were having earlier, that other oscillator or something, whatever you call, has to now keep track of whatever the LFP is doing. In one case, the LFP is changing with speed, then the other guy has to go even faster. In the other case, in our virtual reality, when the LFP doesn't have speed dependence, then this guy has to slow down. That's right. You got and your model, that's it. Yeah, I'm coming to yeah, it. Good. Okay. So, and that's then it. you drive the so-called one oscillator by Stefan's method at arbitrary frequency. Ooh, what is like the one whatever oscillator? frequency, the, 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 the clock signal, right? Yeah. That clock now is changed from 8 hertz to something else. Yeah. And still the other oscillator keeps track of it, which means that the other oscillator has none of its own internal dynamics. It just follows whatever is out there with some speed. Mm -hmm. And if I understand biophysics, plus a space dependent offset. Yeah, plus space mm -hmm. dependent offset. So how would that work? That the other oscillator will keep keep track of it at all frequencies, and at all kinds of speed dependence, and all kinds of. I find that that's a mystery that I'm trying to grapple with. And also, I want to ask why. No, why is God made it? So let's say. <laughs> <laughs> why I don't care. As long as we can understand the biophysical mechanism, How we God being God of peace, so that's fine. Why the questions? <laughs> <laughs> why is it? It's why? a good question, but we can't answer it. We can answer it. Maybe. But, but I think that's the question. So It's an easy way to make the system work. Yeah. You change the difference between the frequencies, no, but, you change the scale of the system. But why phase procession? It's that's very powerful. No, phase procession. So what's per phase procession seems a little unnecessary to me. What do you get out of that? <laughs> well, I'm talking about my mother here. <laughs> <laughs> so you can okay. Any serious thought saying, why do we care about play what's cells? What's a first thing, first thing Neil Ferguson said to me is, like, I don't need play cells. I can make the whole thing work without them. <laughs>
in fact, it's almost the end of a beautiful romance. So, so that is. <laughs> Are we moving into the same building? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a director, maybe I won't be. <laughs> the, the idea is that if there is phase precession, then you can learn temporal sequences. That's the key reason. Because if place spins are this big and STDP cares for 50 milliseconds, then the whole thing is not going to work with possible rate modulated Poisson process. What you need is temporal sequence compression. In phase precession, will achieve this, and several people have shown. Yeah, I think it can. Yeah. So that's the key thing. Unless you find a way to make NMDA dependent plasticity one second wide, then you got that's not going to work. So that 50 millisecond. So you need that. And in strictly speaking, you don't even need phase precession. Strictly speaking, you don't I even keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all they need is precise <laughs> timing, right, between two neurons. The relevant pairs of neurons should fire at the same timing. It doesn't have to be periodic. Periodicity is a nice way to achieve it many times. When we have LTP experiment, you want that precise pairing to occur so multiple times. So we don't times. need either oscillation to phase precession for, for... No, you yeah. need low frequency correlated noise. That's enough. But nature so may achieve it. you want them to produce LTP? Sorry, is that what you're... No, I mean, that's, that's the rationale for, for phase precession as LTP. That's right. Uh, NMDA dependent LTP of all kind, one particular kind. And that's yeah. It's one possible rationale. It's right. There could be lots of them. It's a phenomenon. No, but one possible. It's a phenomenon. There are other ones. No, phenomenon. I agree with. I mean, fly, it's, everybody observes it, but, but computationally, there is one. The only one I can think of, and maybe yeah, others <coughs> that I'm not aware of. You yeah, also it's sort of a, in you add to. So if you have a bunch of velocity modulated oscillators with cosine tuning, you put them together, whenever you get a big peak, the phase pressure is always there, you can prove that. It is inevitable in, in that sense. But see, again, there we, I will bring back my favorite thing, noise. If there is substantial amount of noise, will that always happen? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so noise, when theta like means 6 to 12 hertz, that's like a factor of two difference in yeah. frequency of period of theta, right? It's going, that's how we calculate theta. 6 to 12, so will you get this always in that case? Yeah, at least not obvious to me. But I think that comes back to the question of how that second oscillator emerges, so yeah. which, uh, which yeah. we don't know. So, yeah. and it might emerge in a way so that it's actually coupled to the to well, the base frequency. So that's the the original. The idea yeah. is that it's 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 coupled in some way. So then, but again, it can be modulated independently. But yeah, in so that, in the resting state, it's they're always, they're always yeah. Happy. So that you know, and and, and essentially, what I, I mean, my you know, my simple thinking about that is, you know, that uh, that most noise in such a system would be a common noise, you know, that is, that's uh, that's common to both to both frequencies. So, uh, you know, if the second oscillator emerges, you know, out of the out of the same circuitry, essentially. So. Or a shared circuitry, I, you know, and I don't know what that is. So yeah. I, I, I don't know uh, whether anyone knows, you know, how the how the higher oscillation frequency emerges. You know, I think the best model think, yeah. is probably the Geisler model <coughs> you know, that has yeah. that has uh, has suggested a relation a relation between between the two. So, although in my reading, you know, the Geisler model actually uh, predicts the opposite. You know, that the lower frequency oscillator actually emerges from the higher frequency one. That's right. One. So that's exactly right. All place cells are going yeah. at nine hertz. Yes. Mm -hmm. You add them up, and you get eight hertz. Yes. But that requires very precise phase synchronization yeah. when they start. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In such noisy networks, again, I get nervous yeah. when you require such precise yeah. synchrony. I also have to, you know, our data actually would suggest the opposite because we can, you know, manipulate the lower frequency oscillator and get the higher frequency one. So, and then also one thing that uh, is not always well advertised is, you know, the the degree of phase precession between different neurons is quite uh, variable. So in the in the rat, you know, uh, most uh, neurons are phase process quite well, although also at different slopes. Yeah. Uh, in the mouse, actually, uh, the the fraction of phase precession cells yeah. in our hands, at least, is uh, is not nearly as high as it is in rats. So that's why mice are stupider than rats. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> 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 So, I so that, so, th right. so there is noise in the sense, you know, that uh, right. that some cells, you know, seem to have uh, 
a, a very you know a very tightly coupled behavior you know that, that yeah. results in phase position others uh, don't so I think for, for this two oscillator thing, there are a couple of observations that I think I asked, which will be still worth figuring out. One is several people have reported precession being very nonlinear, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. abundantly demonstrated. It will be good if two oscillator mm -hmm. model can replicate that. Uh, other thing is the experiment you mentioned, the Zugaro Buzaki experiment, that you shut yeah. down the activity for 200 milliseconds, yeah. precession starts exactly where it is. Yeah. Whereas the current version does not do that. No, well, it, it's inherited from the antimonal cortex. Yeah, I so mean, that's so uh, the same experiment in the antimonal cortex. Somehow, that, that's that right. Be, that would be an interesting experiment. Yeah. It's also pretty gross. I mean, I, I like Stefan's thing of the, sure. using up your genetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with some method. Yeah. control, some. some. Yeah. Uh, it'd, be a lot, it'd be nice to patch dendrites. Yeah. It'd be nice to actually look at what's going on. I mean, so all of this is indirect evidence. It's all kind of weird. You're making assumptions. It's all, it's all, as they say, it's all, as my mother would say, it's all this theory. <laughs> <laughs> but why do I theory? There, is a, there happens to be an alternate theory that doesn't suffer from these problems. That's the asymmetric rank theory. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that can, doesn't suffer from noise issues. That can you just need to keep adding system. all these other things to turn off the fire. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to have all these just things to turn off. The, turn, them all off turn them all off <laughs> so that the fire again drops in the... Uh, and the phase possession continues. I don't think there's a model which doesn't have absolute problems. And I don't think that there's a model which is invulnerable to noise. So throwing noise at, at a particular model is right. Unless if there is, it, you should tell us. Which <laughs> my my velocity free distance. Ah your velocity free <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Assuming you can recall uh, cells as spike several uh, theta cycles successively during REM sleep, is there a phase precession? Uh, yes. Mm. But there is no speed. Oh, yeah, the animal thinks he's running. <laughs> what do you do in sleep? You're running away from somebody all the time. You're always running away. No, no, clearly the animal thinks he's running. So the whole, I mean, it's not actual speed, it's not actual movement, it's brain. Mm -hmm. It's a correlative discharge saying I'm running. Good try. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks, John. <laughs>